Good morning, everybody, and Merry Christmas. It's coming right around the corner. My name is Jeff Dury, Senior Director with Choice Partners here in Houston. And uh, we're doing this uh, both uh, virtual and in person. We've got a number of folks in person. They're getting to enjoy our coffee and soft drinks and muffins and, and all the little egg, egg and cheese sandwiches and all that. So next time, if you're local, come, all right? <laughs> anyway, so we appreciate everybody coming, and I think that they keep, and Joanne keeps adding people minute by minute here on the, uh, on the, uh, on the virtual part also. We're going to try and tell you a little bit about who we are as Choice Partners. I know there's a, a lot of familiar faces in here, probably online also, and uh, hopefully it's a, a refresher for some of you folks that know a little bit about us. If you don't know a lot about us, maybe you're new to purchasing or new to whatever facilities or some of these departments, uh, hopefully we can help you out. And uh, one thing we always like to say is we don't want this to be the beginning and ending of the conversation. If we're new to you, let it be an introduction. Use us down the way. We're not here to just say hello and, and goodbye. We do these just, I think, every quarter. So we do them pretty regularly. And so they can serve as refreshers for a lot of people. Or if you're brand new, you can come back again or reach out to any of us also. All right. This is our team. If you're wondering who Choice Partners is, uh, this, this is who we are. I think we've got just about every, everybody there. Uh, we may or may not, uh, are we missing, we got everybody in? I'm missing Christy. Christy, oh, we have one out on FMLA with, a, with, a, with back surgery. So we're missing one person, but there's 19 of, there are a couple of uh, uh, field reps out there uh, that are out uh, working with a lot of the members and vendors out in the field also but that's kind of our crazy team they all have smiles that day because i think we uh we had jello shot no no we, no we <laughs> that was uh that was uh that was our christmas photo here in the building in front of the tree down the down the hall all right so what are we going to talk about this is just a loose agenda we're going to try and have you out of here in time and uh, we're going to talk about a couple of different things. I'm going to kind of do some of the introductory items, and we're going to have a, a legal discussion. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how you navigate our website, how you can utilize our website to find your due diligence, to just find vendors, things like that. Then we're going to have a conversation about uh, uh, construction, renovation, maintenance, what is, what is legal, what's not. What is JOC? What is IDIQ? What can you do? What can you not do? Some of the laws, some of the case laws that have happened that tell you what's good, bad, or indifferent, and uh, kind of tell you a little bit about, uh, about the co-op world in general. All right. So really, not everybody knows exactly how a co-op operates. I know, I, mean, I know some of the faces in here and, and probably online, I know this is going to be a review, but how does a co-op operate? What, what are we, what, what is, what are we or any of the other people that call themselves a co-op doing out there? This little triangle is kind of a nice little visual of what a co-op brings to the table. If any of you folks are in, in purchasing or, or procurement or even, you know, facilities, any of the type areas, your, your, your government, for the most part, we do, do work with uh, not-for-profits also, but you're pretty much in government and everybody knows that that four letter word is RFP, right? That's every, RFP takes forever to do. That's my Aggie math, but that's, that's another story. But uh, the RFP is very, 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 very time consuming, very labor intensive and using a co-op contract helps you save time and money. You know, two, two things, helps you save time and money. And how do we do it? Basically there's a local agreement that's uh, executed buying between a member, which is where a lot of you guys work or where you're from, uh, and Choice Partners or HCDE, which is Harris County Department of Ed. That's who we work for. That's what it says on the bottom of our checks, but we are Choice Partners division within HCDE. And that allows you to utilize our contracts. It's executed basically saying that you can use our contracts. And then we have the vendor side, the vendors that you guys use, the vendors that we award. We we'll just award one vendor, we'll multi award. The vendor uh, will uh, respond to a Choice Partners RFP or HCDE slash Choice Partners RFP. 
they'll receive a contract and they'll be able to use that. We always talk to uh, the vendors and we call it a hunting license or a fishing license. They can take that and go, you know, go in, uh, and call on, uh, you know, HISD, U of H, uh, KDISD, any, any of the, any, anyone they want to and not have to respond to a lot of RFPs and therefore the, the entities don't have to write a lot of RFPs and waste a lot of time. And then there's also the PO that's executed between you guys and the vendor, the CP member and the vendor. I know it's a little bit of a, uh, it's, it's probably a review for a lot of people, but that's kind of how it works. And the legal aspect is right here, allowing them to use our contracts. Okay, I'm gonna try and keep my time at or below my, my 15 minutes so we can kind of get onto some of the, some of the more uh, meaty stuff here. I've mentioned HCDE a couple of times. <clears throat> what is HCDE? I've just used the acronym. <clears throat> HCDE is Harris County Department of Education. As you see in the little, the middle block in here, HCDE has been around for a couple of years since the 1880s. And it was uh, one of the original uh, uh, county school districts within the state of Texas, 254 counties in Texas. And 253 have gone by the wayside. There's one left and it's left here in the largest county in Texas. And we still operate uh, performing a lot of services to the surrounding area. And in our case, on, on a national basis. Okay. So HCDE, this is kind of a little graphic of who HCDE is. Uh, if you're in the K-12 business, you probably know what an education service center is. We do some of the things that an education service center does and a lot of other things also, but there's, there's a five main pillars uh, and I'll just kind of go through them real quick. This could be a 30 minute conversation and a lot of our HCDE people will make it a 30 minute or an hour conversation because of a lot of the different things uh, that we do. But adult ed, uh, we do adult education, uh, case for kids after school programs, Head Start programs for a lot of the, the, the youngsters, the three, four, five-year-old types, special schools for troubled and adjudicated youth, and therapy services for uh, therapy services for the, the kid, the students in various districts. And then there's a number of other uh, divisions that are, in, that are housed within HCDE. You see a little circle there, Choice Partners. We're one of those, uh, we're one of those, one of those divisions. We have continued to grow we are combined as we are, we had the food, we have the commodities and the construction slash jock. <clears throat> and they've been in existence for probably 40 or 50 years in some form or fashion, but about 10 or so years ago, they were all combined into one to call Choice Partners now also. So we've Choice Partners in some form or fashion has been around for quite a while. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Gibson, but I also want to say just a couple of things also, but kind of housekeeping I shouldn't have said, I should have said before. If you're here in the building, restrooms right on the other side of this wall, you're not going to hurt my feelings or anyone up here if you want to get up and get a cup of coffee or get, get a, get a, get a, uh, something to eat or whatever and just come back. That's fine. Please make sure that your phones are silenced and, uh, that's really, kind of some of the some basic stuff. So I'm gonna let Steve talk and uh, thank you. All right. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Very good introduction. Fire, fire Let me get out. Right. Somebody says fire, follow us all out. We've only done this a hundred right. times. You get what you pay for. It's good. Okay. I think that is on. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I, I owe everybody tremendous thank you for coming out. How many of y'all are just completely covered up year wide on training opportunities? You get plenty of training opportunities everywhere. Yes? No? Really? I've, in that case, I feel honored. I know if y'all if y'all are in purchasing, training is one of the big things. There's so much legally involved in purchasing, and you got to do things the right way, and you've got these procedures you have to follow, and you've got local laws and state laws. Uh, I noticed that 
we had a really, really nice attendance this year. So um, let me just ask, ISDs, how many are representing ISDs? Okay, very good. How many are representing higher education? Super. How many are representing local government? Awesome. Yeah, I've noticed we had local government. We have local government coming from as far away as New Jersey. So, um, and I think we had 165 at my last count was it. So it's, it's, it's great attendance. I want to say I very much appreciate the time and the commitment and, and, and the willingness to hear the, you know, the work we're doing and the resulting products which can benefit you. I just want to show you how, because it's going to vary a little bit depending on your entity. Your law is different if you're in higher education than if you're in an ISD. And if you're in local government, your laws are certainly different. I, I kind of want to tie them all together. Some cases you have federal requirements. And we all get there, but we might get there in slightly different ways. So um, my history, I'm a contract manager here at Choice Partners. Um, since February of 2020, I came in just in time for the pandemic, then went home for a few months, came back in September of 2020, been, been back ever since. I've worked in public and private sector purchasing for the last 20 years. I worked on, uh, I worked for a river authority for most of my purchasing, public purchasing experience. That was a half a billion dollar multi-year project. It was the largest project in Montgomery County history. It was a, we built a $200 million surface water treatment plant. Um, we built 55 miles of pipelines. Amazing. A lot of engineering, a lot of construction, big project, right? And how many of y'all have big projects that you're focused on? It just super important require your total attention. Okay. Well, how many of y'all that have those big projects also don't have lots of little unrelated things that you got to do as well? Does anybody recognize the Pareto rule? Does anybody know what the Pareto rule is? What's another word for the Pareto rule? 80-20 rule? The 80-20 rule, right? So, you know, what I noticed was that 20% of my time was spent on 80% of my purchase orders. And then 80% 80, 80 of my time was spent on my major projects and my, my big things, making sure all my engineering and construction contracts that were very detailed and had multiple reviews and multiple addendums and very detailed multi-party pre-proposal meetings, that was taken up most of my time. But if you're not careful, you'll notice that the urgent will displace the important if you don't keep some of that under control. Everybody kind of in sync and understand that. Sound familiar? Um, and, and I think that's probably one of the reasons, one of the ways that, that you know, that Choice Partners can, can, can help. We want to provide that opportunity. Uh, as mentioned, you know, we do that by making contracts. Um, but we bid those contracts out. We do this legally. We pay a lot of attention to the details. We pay a lot of attention in our contracts to making sure that we have all those laws covered. So um, this slide is just kind of, uh, it's a summary. I, I, I know it's not all the laws because we recently did some sort of an application to Arizona to participate in their something or become accredited. I'm not sure what it was, but I noticed what we submitted had, it seemed like a hundred different laws that we had covered in our contracts. The two that, um, well, I, I just heard, I can cover all of these, but I don't, don't wanna waste everybody's time. I do want you to understand that they are covered in our contract. Um, the two that are important to us first are these two up top. Local government code 271, um, purchasing uh, 791, or sorry, 271 says, a local government that purchases goods and services satisfies any state law requiring the local government to seek competitive bids for the goods and services. Um, 791, this is interlocal cooperative contracts that says that a local government basically does not need to reinvent a, 
reinvent the, we the wheel. If another local government is, is doing something, they can help each other and work together. And that process is outlined in the CNR local agreement. That's from your member, you know, your member agreement with choice partners that basically says, you know, you guys can use some of these contracts that, that we issue. And we not only issue these contracts, we do use these contracts. So HCD is using these contracts. And I know that's not the case with a lot of co-ops that are out there. Some are just in it to make money. Some are not even nonprofits. Um, so education code is 44. If you're in an ISD, that's super important. We've got that covered. Um, 2269, you're in construction other than higher ed, we've got that covered there. Um, I think this is higher education. We've got you covered in the Choice Partners contract. Um, Edgar's. Edgar's was a term I hadn't heard before because my experience was with the River Authority. It was a government agency, but edu, you know that's the Education General Administrative Requirements. And, and I know all of you in the ISDs are very familiar with those, but, but what's the benefit of those? Anybody? If you're doing federal, if you're using federal money or a grant, are those important? Yes, they are. They're very important. Uh, why are they important? You know, cities and counties, maybe y'all aren't as familiar with the Edgars, but, but what's one thing that's in there that makes all the federal stuff a lot safer? The two CFR 200s. So y'all in cities and counties, that's gonna be very, you know, familiar. So uh, the two CFR 200s, you know, six affirmative steps, um, all those requirements are covered in there. Move on to the next slide here. Um, so one of the things that uh, I don't think we've really spent a lot of time on before, but I thought was important, and maybe it's, it's one of the reasons that these contracts are useful to you. Um, I mean, how many people think that you can, you know, just get the right product at the right time to the right people and you're done, right? No, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. We're all about documentation. We're all about making things right. So when you're using a co-op, you know, what do you do? You just get, you just get your purchase order. You write co-op number on it and send it to the vendor and you're done. How many people think that's okay. So, I mean, really, if you're doing your job, you're going to, you're going to take a peek into that due diligence and make sure that you know, you've covered all your bases basically, because it's, it's still the entity's requirement. We can set the contracts up, but we can't always say that every contract we set up is, is completely appropriate for you. We can cover all the laws in the contract, but still your responsibility for the documentation of, of all that. So um, let's get to my notes here. Here's another question for y'all. Do y'all still need three quotes when you're working? I'd like to throw this one out to everybody online. So if you're online listening, um, and this could be your entity requirements. Are you required to get three quotes by your entity? And you can just sit in the chat, uh, three quotes, no matter what, or no, one if co-op. Just, just let us know. I'm, I mean, I'm very curious to know that. So. One of the things you may not need to continue to get three quotes. Now you may want to, but you shouldn't have to. And there are some exceptions. Does anybody might know the exception to the one quote when you're using a co-op pool? Okay, what if you're using federal money? So you're still gonna have to go back to the CFR 200 and there's gonna be a requirement in that. So if it's not federal money, you're probably okay getting with one quotes. Make sure you talk to your, your supervisors and your attorneys. You know, we're not that, but just make sure. Anyway, moving on, so I don't take up tons of time. Let's go and look and see what's inside the due diligence file. In the side of the due diligence file, which if you go to the contract landing page, you do have to be logged in. And if you have a login, you'll be able to see a couple of things on here that you won't see if you're not logged in. One of them is this due diligence 
button right here. And if you click on that, it's going to open up a zip file. I wanted to talk about what's in that zip file. So you'll see if you open up, we, we do keep them numbered. Um, but these are the steps that we go through. And this is a documentation that's there. So this can help you as you're going through. We do multi-award contracts. Um, so most of our contracts have more than one contractor doing the same or similar things. How do you know which one is the best one for you? You might say, okay, well, I like this vendor. He's on his partners, let's do it. But if you wanted to justify that, we've got some tools in here that we can show you as well. Uh, the first thing about our process is that before we advertise an opportunity to contract with choice partners, we're going to put out an independent estimate. Um, and this is a 2CFR 200 requirement. Um, so we've, we've covered that. We have to know basically what it's going to be, what it's going to cost. You have to make sure um, before we advertise it, because otherwise, how are you going to know? if something's reasonable or not. We're gonna put a, our, our legal advertisement. So this is an affidavit. This is in here. And you see the way they're numbered. Um, the file names are actually numbered. So they're in order. If you sort by that file name, it'll put these things kind of roughly in chronological order. And I think it'll be helpful to you. Uh, but the legal ads there, that's number two. Number three. The RFP document. This RFP document is really important for you to look at. Um, what's there is you're going to be able to confirm the scope and the specification. You're also going to have the contract between vendor and choice partners. Now, that contract will allow for something very important, which you also need to be aware of. That's a supplemental agreement. Um, so there is the main contract here. Obviously, this contract is, since we're working with so many different entities, it's going to be very general. Your vendors will probably, they'll quote you, part of that, you can call that part of that kind of supplemental agreement. Um, if your services are more complicated, they're, you know, say staffing services, you're also going to have a supplemental agreement. You're going to need to review that as well, because both things are important. Um, the contract is in section five of the RFP, and um, that's a very good thing to be familiar with. Uh, addenda is the next thing, and I didn't put up one. We don't like addenda, but we have to do them occasionally. I'm sure. Does anybody here really like addenda? <laughs> they can be useful. I mean, we, you know, I don't think I ever had a major construction project without an addenda. Some had many. Um, Evaluation summary. Okay, we have to evaluate these proposals. We just can't hire everybody who wants to work with us. Um, one of the ways that we do that, we do that um, by, uh, I think it's 44, education is the general thing, gives us the things that we are supposed to evaluate. So uh, what price is gonna be 40% or less than 40%. You're gonna have quality, experience and reputation. Um, and we'll have a few others there that are maybe just worth five points. Um, but we measure all those and those are per the law. Um, when we're talking price, the next thing on the list, bit tabulation. Okay, I just took a snapshot of one item, but um, price is important. We have to evaluate that. So. To do that, you kind of need to have apples to apples things. So we do have some summary lines, which we can use and we put out there so that we can generate a market basket and we can find out, you know, who's high on this item. Uh, I think this item, it's, it's small and a little bit blurry, but I think it was uh, plastic bags for a promotional um, items RFP I put out. And you can basically see where everybody's, he's at 45, 51, 54. And we take that into account and, and we award points based on you know, pricing. That's gonna be 40%. So, so far, everything we've covered here is available there. Um, the supplier response, this is a good thing. You should read it. 
um, take a quick look at it. It's, it's not too long, but there is some information in it that's really important. So one of the things that you want to look for is what's their discount? Because when we put this thing out and invite them to respond, we're going to ask what's your, what, what discount? We want, to, we want to see your catalog. We also want to know what discount if it's a commodity. Um, so you want to write, say, it could be a discount on services if it's a non-commodity. This one is 10%. Now, we're also going to ask them for their catalog. You're going to take that catalog and take that 10% discount. That's how you know where the pricing is. Now, they can meet or beat it but they can't quote you anything worse and be in alignment. But that's your check. That's how you know your thing's different. Um, quick question for y'all. Um, if you don't send the signed purchase order to the co-op, is your purchase still compliant? Right. I'm going to repeat that for, for everybody. So she's, it depends on the requirements of the co-op. And, and that's true, a very valid response. Some co-ops won't require it. Um, the question, you know, if I had to answer that, I would say, well, we'd all know. It might be, because if you don't send it to us, you're relying on the vendor to do that. And they, when we do ask our vendors to report the transactions. Um, and then it, it gets recorded and it's in our systems. So if, if you don't and they don't, then yeah, I can't really say if that's compliant or not. I guess that's kind of the legality. You may have done enough steps to feel comfortable. Uh, the one service that we will do, if you ever have a quote that you'd like us to review, and you know if you either don't have time or have trouble getting access to it or just, just need help logging in, we will help you with that. We'll provide you everything you need to do to evaluate that quote. We'll even put our two cents on it. Uh, you will always get somebody to answer to the phone at Choice Partners. Um, so yeah, definitely review. This is their supplier response. So uh, they're also going to send a catalog. Edgar's I mentioned. Okay, so if you're in ISD, I know you all know what Edgar's are. If you're in higher education, I know you do too. Um, did it just go away? There it is, okay. This is a whole bunch of legalities that they have to sign off on. And I'm not gonna cover all of them. I mean, just, just know it, I think it's like 11 pages now. It, it's, it's a lot of little things to act, the Davis-Bacon Act, anything that's gonna be required from Texas or federal is gonna be in there. Um, pricing, and I brought this one in here. It's making its way over there, slow internet connection. This is good. So they're not required to put the choice partner's price. Um, list price, they should do. They, might, they may not always, sometimes we have them in there that say this is a choice partner's price, but usually you know, what we prefer, list price plus discount. So this, in addition to the discount, which is on their supplier response, is what you're gonna to use to make sure that what they've quoted you is compliant. It can be less than that, can't be more. Um, so this is very good. I like the way they did it here. Here they've got, they tell you what the discount is on each item. I think that's fantastic. All right, um, Texas paperwork, the 1295 form. How many were around when that monstrosity came into play? It wasn't that fun trying to figure that out. Okay, but yes, we do it. We actually do it every year. So when we renew them, we do it as well. We also do the SAM. That's uh, every year. That is the background check for the department. Have they been debarred or so? That's in the file every year. Um, this is the letter that we send them out. This is the contract. So when we get the contract signed, so those two documents are in the file. I'm almost done, I promise. So I know my director's shaking his head. Why is he talking so long? Um, renewal. 
every year we go through an evaluation and renewal process. Um, so that documentation is going to be in the file. And with that, um, I'll just mention, you know, in closing, we cover um, several areas, food, cafeteria, technology, commodities, services, facilities, including construction. You want to stay around if you're buying construction to hear all of Stevens. He's going to talk about job order contracting. It's a very good presentation. Um, and uh, the other thing, my last ask of you today, if you see us out at a trade show, stop by, say hello, pick up a contract list and just look, because you know we want to make sure, and this is what I did when I was a buyer. I went around, I, I, I just want to know that these contracts are going to be there when I need them. I don't need them right now, but I don't want to wait until I need them to have to start chasing them. I want to get familiar. No, you know, who has what contracts? Who has what vendors? This vendor I like has a contract here. It can be very easy. I can't tell you what a relief it was when I was a buyer, when I had a leaky roof, I was able to call a contractor right away, get someone out there like the next day. Um, are there any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. She has asked um, if the annual evaluation process is tied to the renewal. And yes, it is. We generally get that process started about three to four months ahead. Um, and you know what we're looking at is, are they compliant to our contract? Are they doing what they say they're supposed to do in the contract? Are they promoting the contract? The vendor is supposed to actually promote these contracts. Um, the vendor has to report. Are they reporting if they're not reporting? Uh, the vendor actually has a minimum. If they're not using the contracts, we're not gonna renew them. So um, the vendor has a few criteria that we are gonna look at. Uh, we'll look at it early on, you know, let them know, hey, y'all need to do this. It's a part of the contract maintenance process. And I'm about to get pulled off the stage. So, um, but if you have any questions, come talk to me or any of us here at Choice Partners and we will be glad to help with you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tricia Presto Giacomo. She's going to talk about food. Let's see what I got here. Where did I put this thing? Hold that sec. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. I'll try not to jingle too much. I forgot I had this thing on. Um, what was I going to say? Okay. My name is Trisha Press Jacobo, and I know it's a long word, but people are getting better and better at saying it. It's a big joke here. I handle all the food contracts for Choice Partners, and I'm excited to see there's quite a few of you here today. And I know there's a lot online, so it's great to see y'all here. Um, I really quick just want to introduce two of my employees, um, Laura Spray in the green and Melissa Wilder. She's new. She's just been here like, what, about a year? We also have one more employee. What happened? I did. Sorry, y'all. My fingers got crazy, I guess. Okay. Um, anyways. We also have another employee, Emily, and um, she's been on medical leave. So hopefully she'll be back in January. So I just wanted you to see them, put a face to a name since there's so many food people here. So um, I have been here for about eight years. I um, came from SciFair ISD. I was a buyer for food service there. And I was actually at the co-op, this co-op when it was just a food co-op, when it was just um, Gulf Coast Food Co-op. So for any of y'all, People that have been around a while, a lot of people know that name. So um, I've been back. Um, everything's been going good. I did want to say something about a couple of things Steve said, because um, our contracts on the food side are a little different because, as you know, we have to follow TDA and USDA regulations, and all of our contracts do. Also, most of our, actually would say probably 90% of our food contracts are also um, line item bids. 
it's kind of a requirement. Um, the only one that I think is not line item is going to be our food equipment small wares contract because there's no way you can do a line item bit. If you're in food service, you know that that would be impossible. So anyways, um, oh, you didn't go back far enough. I guess that's good. Back, back. Okay, so here is a list of all of our contracts for um, food cafeteria. So when I talk about food, it's just not food. We're talking about cafeteria, um, chemicals for cleaning the, cleaning the cafeterias, food equipment, small wares, um, we have quite a few contracts, as you can see. Um, we are going to, um, like this spring, we have a couple that we have at our chemical bid. We have a branded uh, food contract, which is really like um, Domino's, Pizza Hut. So we'll put a brand new bid out for that. Um, we might be doing a brand new grocery bid. Not sure yet. We'll decide come first of the year. That's a huge undertaking in itself. Um, I'm trying to think of what else next okay a couple of things i just want to put a little notes in here for those of you on the food side procurement um I, I have said it before and i said in a couple other meetings just so you're aware of it all of the food contracts were were evaluated by tda over the summer and not just us the co-ops the food co-ops in the state were all evaluated they checked they had access to our website they went through everything so if you're getting a procurement audit or an annual review audit this year or coming up, they shouldn't be asking you for all the documentation on the procurement side because they've already done it. It makes no sense for you know 30 districts to use the same contract with let's say Borden's Dairy and then audit every single one when they've already done it once. Now they're probably gonna they're gonna ask you for they're gonna pull some invoices and ask to look at bid pricing. Um, I also, I'm gonna go over in just a second real quick because I know a lot of people, this is a big thing on our side, is the website where everything's at on food. But all of our documents are posted there that you're gonna need for any um, review. We are having a meeting, a member meeting um, to kind of welcome in 2022. We don't have the full agenda yet, but I'm sure we're gonna have, our um, lawyer is going to do a little probably about an hour session on procurement we may have some vendors come in and talk about the craziness lately of um, price increases i'm sending them out daily i can't we can't even keep up it's just across the board i have i think i did for one of our distributors i said three monday two yesterday and two this morning thing so they're constant price increases it's just there's so much to take into account so we may do a little bit of that. Maybe we have some manufacturers or some brokers come in and just talk about what's going on. Um, we may do a little bit of product testing. So just mark your calendar. And this is, well, you'll get an invite for that. It'll be in person. It's too hard to do a food meeting, virtual and in person. There's a lot of people like to walk around and talk and catch up and stuff. And then we also, can, it's hard to imagine, we already have our date set for our 2022 nutrition and product show. It is Thursday, October 14th at the Humble Civic Center. We do do a dinner the night before on the 13th. Um, if you get an invite, please come. It's a great time. And then the other side of Choice Partners does a product exhibit, and that'll be the next day, October 15th at the, at the same place at the Humble Civic Center. Okay, real quick, I'll go fast. Um, this is about our food member. This is for food cafeteria related contracts. So if that's all you're needing at one point in time, you'll see if you go up username, password, right below your password, it's a little tiny checkbox. And it says, log into food area only. The fastest way to get there, check that box, press log in. There you go. Now you'll be on the food members dashboard. You'll see a picture of me, Laura, gotta get Emily up there, <laughs> Melissa up there, it hasn't happened yet. Um, but there's a bunch of red tabs down here and this is what you're going to look at this is just list all our current vendors this tab is all commodity processing if you click that it will list the scpds's the calculators everything's in there the pricing tab over here has all of our current pricing and we also usually post last year's school pricing so make sure you're pulling the correct one it, it says school year 2021 or 21 22 inactive contracts for due diligence there's some resources we have child nutrition labels um this is the big one right here procurement annual review documents everything you need for your procurement annual review if they're asking you for it is in there 
click that link, upload everything. And I always tell people save it to your computer for all the contracts that you use with choice. But if you have questions, like if you need help, please contact one of us because we're here to help you with your audits. And it's, I have already talked to two districts this week that are getting audited this week, right before Christmas. So there's a lot of stress going on. And then this last one is the Buy American provisions. Okay, and then um, if you, does anybody have any questions? Were there any questions? No questions? I know I said it really fast. Okay, um, Janet's gonna go over the whole website. I just pulled out a little bit about um, our website side. Thank you. Don't get crazy with it like I did. Okay. Good morning, Hi, everyone. I'm Janet Walks, and I work in the division that does the marketing for Choice Partners. So I'm half Choice Partner oriented and half marketing oriented. So if you have any questions about marketing or how you'd like to navigate the website, I have brought some of my uh, business cards and they're back in the back left corner here and online you can find us I'll show you where you can contact us we have that as part of our presentation so this is going to be one of the main places you can start on your own to learn more about your member benefits and how you can get access to them so uh, let's try again as she said the member login whew, this thing's fast one of the things we want to show you, this is the first place when you go to log in, there's the main tab on the home page. It says member login in the upper right hand corner, or there's a drop down you can go to log in. If you do not have a login ID already, right here at the bottom, it says set up a new account. And that's where you go. And what we want to let you know is our system is set up to auto populate. You can't just type in your whole name. So if your name is like ours, Harris County Department of Education, you can start typing Harris County and then you'll have a drop down. And that drop down will start with Harris County because they are a member, but underneath it, then you'd find Department of Education. Select that, then you complete your registration. We have some people that get stuck at that step, but it's very easy. So let it auto populate, select it, and then you can complete your registration. You do have to get two emails. The first one says, howdy, thanks for registering. And the second one says, now you're approved, you're good to go. We have to get you in our system. And I will say this to anybody that's online or here. If you're here, you're probably already a member and your name's in there. But if you register and immediately try to go set up an account, it doesn't work. You have to give us an hour or so to get your name in our system as a member. Many of our out-of-state members uh, try and do that one, two, three, all in a row, which is great that you're interested, but just give us a couple hours. And you can send an email that says, hey, I tried to register, but it didn't work. And we'll make sure to, to advance your name and get it in the system right away. So once you've done member login up here, if you're not going to food, come right down here to login. And then you come to what I call the backbone of our website for you as a member. It is our member dashboard, and there's several buttons on there that we want you to access. You can also see some quick, quick view information right here. But on the top row, the left-hand corner, what you'll see is a contract list. That list is updated monthly after every board meeting. So it'll be current when you go there. So if you're in a meeting and somebody calls you out and says, where did you get this contract? Or do you know if there's something like that through a co-op? You can go online. You can also download that list as a PDF and then send it out to either your purchasing division or any other departments within your organization that would like to do some research themselves of, oh, I need to get a new sink for the break room or I need to get some new cabling for some uh, computer equipment we're doing. We do have five categories of contracts. And so that's a great way to go look for it. And I wanna tell you now, and for those of you that are in person or if you've looked online, in the bag that you got here in person, there should be a contract list in there. We have told you we have five categories. Four of them are all together alphabetically by subcategory on pages one through three. So that would be our facility services, technology, uh, commodities and services. But if you go to the very back page, page four is where you're gonna find a listing for all the food contracts and food equipment contracts. So we pulled those out for quick access for you. And then 
If you come over to this button here, top row in the middle, it says current vendors. That is your e-listing, your electronic view of all the contracts. And this is very important because this is where you can start delving in to the information relative to that contract or to that vendor. We have some information I'll show you soon, but that can help you get started on your look for who can fit the project need that you have. Over here, we have a get a quote function. It's actually an online get a quote function. Very, very informative and helpful. Cut your time in half. You don't have to advertise and pay for that. You can actually use get a quote to, to request information from any of the choice partner vendors. You do not use our get a quote button to shop the whole world. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know, it might seem normal or natural to you, but we have had some members say, oh, how come I couldn't find so-and-so? And I go, well, they're not an awarded vendor with choice. But when you utilize this, it goes straight to where your project is. And I'll show you later how to complete that. Now at the same member dashboard, this is where you can get to Trisha's dashboard she showed you. If you don't click that button, when you first register as a member login, you can go here and hit it and you'll come to that same dashboard that's all for food. And then down here, bottom row in the middle is our supply catalog. Many of you, if you're very new, might not be aware that Choice Partners has two ways you can shop with us. One is through our existing contracts where you have to get your own quote or develop your own project. But we also have an online supply catalog with over 1100 hard bid line items, which means the pricing is there it's all available to you online. It has 11 special categories. So they're products that are high volume, high, high volume purchases and high volume in requests from our members. So you can go quickly to that. One of the ones that amazed me is when I went to the Valley in Texas Valley <laughs> and we, I went to a small town that was a new member and they said, well, before we get started, I have to purchase something for our government. It was the city government and they said, I need to have a defibrillator because it's a requirement for federal or state offices to have this available. Well, I could take them right to our supply catalog. They didn't even have to use the get a quote or the get a quote up here. They could go right there and in our supply catalog, we have already priced out, had done our own bid. There was a defibrillator. There were the pads that come with it and other essentials that helped them. They go, oh my gosh, because I'm a member, I can go do that right away. I don't have to shop around. I don't have to go out for bids. So it's, it's really beneficial to you. If you can go to this button and take a look at what we have there, you'll see a um, five digit number that comes up on the supply catalog. That's assigned by us. That means the vendors that responded to our RFP for the supply catalog said that they would give item A with our five digit number at this price and, and you just, and you're done. One, two, three, bam, it's done. So it's, it's a good place to get started. And then you can download the supply catalog. We don't send out CDs and we don't print a copy, but it is available to download as a PDF. We will just give you the caveat that if you download it, be aware that we do allow in this volatile market the uh, vendors that responded and were awarded the opportunity every quarter to let us know if they have to change prices. If any of you in here have tried to purchase paper, you know that those prices go up and down. You heard Trisha say even this morning, she got price changes. We try and monitor that so that it's not regular, but the market's just been very, very erratic this last year. So Downloading a PDF isn't the best, but at least it'll give you a heads up to review. But if you want the exact pricing, go online and you'll have the current pricing for that day. So this is a little bit more about the supply catalog. Uh, and this is where we just tell you the percentages are available. You can see the e-catalog. Like I said, it's all right there. If you want a detailed training on how to utilize and shop through the supply catalog, please give me a call. We can either do it in person or online. I can do it uh, an individual or with the group, you know, your whole entity. We'll say this though, that unless you specify what we call a super user with your organization, when you have completed your filling out of the order online and hit submit, it just goes into a draft folder. It does not send the PO directly to the vendor. 
If, however, your organization approves that you can do that, call us or send us an email and say, I want so-and-so to be approved user for our organization. Then when they hit submit, it goes directly to the vendor. So it just depends on what works best with your own purchasing organization. Now, this is one, uh, it's a view, a part of the what we call a landing page. Every vendor that's been awarded has their own landing page. So I just wanna show you some of the different parts that we have here. You're all, this is the category, so that's what helps you get started, but you're always gonna want this contract number on any quote you receive from our vendor and on any PO or way you purchase, even if you purchase with a credit card or heaven forbid, it'd be cash if anybody remembers what that is anymore. But you have to have some kind of documentation with this on here. And the reason we're sharing that with you is because that's what helps keep you compliant. If you're audited, they're going to say, how did you legally procure this using public funds? You're going to say, ta-da, there it is, all well and good. And then they come back to our website or to us, and it's all there. So it's our job to help you stay compliant. If, however, we have a vendor, many of them might have some new sales reps, and they provide you with a quote and they forgot to put their contract number on there, just push it right back and say, would you please redo this or send it back? Put it on there, the name choice partners or the contract number or both. Actually, both is the very best way to cover yourself. And so we like to share that with you. And here you can see when it was uh, initially awarded, but you can also see that there's three remaining uh, renewals. So that kind of tells you how you're working with a vendor, how long they're gonna be awarded and the, their options for renewals. Now I have confirmed that if you really have a project that needs to be done and the renewals are zero and it looks like they might end in a month, but your project's gonna take a little longer. If you and that vendor sign a contract and you make sure that it has the contract number and it's all in accordance with our uh, award to them, then you are covered through the end of that project, okay? So it's not like you have to say, oh my gosh, you're losing your contract. I'm not gonna deal with you. No, no, you can do it. It's, it's all compliant, okay? So if you have any other questions, that's why we put this information on here. We wanted to add the CP contract number, I mean, uh, contract manager, so that if you have questions before, during, or after your involvement with the vendor, you can reach out to uh, a neutral uh, person and say, tell me what you know about this vendor in the past, or this is my project, do they seem like a good fit? Or are they near where I'm at? Or whatever question you might have, delve into their um, contract. Maybe you have something that's a specific need that you wanna make sure is covered. That's why we'll put that information there. And then over here, you can actually see the contact information for the vendor themselves. And as Steve was saying, to me, the due diligence is extremely important to all purchasing staff because it gives you the needed backup materials for your PO request. So there's a lot of information right here on the vendor landing page, and you'd be able to get to that from our website. Now, the get a quote, which is one of the things I wanted you to know is a very important tool to access. When you get a quote, number one, it does not obligate you to purchase if they respond, okay? So don't be afraid to use the tool. But we have told our vendors that if they get a notice from our system, from the get a quote, that it's a warm lead, somebody's interested, they're looking. I understand there are times when sometimes you need to budget in the fall for maybe a project in the spring, many school districts do this, even even some cities do, and you might be getting a quote now to encumber funds for later, but it doesn't obligate you and at least it gets you in dialogue with it. So it's very easy to do. At the top, the first thing you select is the category. So this whole form resembles that contract award list that you have in the, bas uh, in the bag that you got today or as you can find online. Uh, then you come down and you pick when you pick the category, the system distills out all our vendors to find only the vendors awarded in those categories. And then you come down here and you just describe what you want. So if you were looking to get cabling for uh, some new computers that you had already purchased, you just put that in there. I have, you know, five drop down boxes. I need some cabling. I need this and that, however you want to do it. Or if you wanted to replace the refrigerator in a cafeteria that had gone out, 
You can describe what you want here, put your contact information here. Down here, we added two buttons that would really help. This one says product or service need by date. What that means is the date that you actually want that product or service in-house, not when you want the quote. Our vendors are educated in responding within 48 hours. When they receive this, 48 hours, they need to get back to you. Even if it's, give me a few more days, I have something that might fit, but I need some information. They need to contact you. If you submit a quote request to four vendors and only three respond, don't go back to the fourth vendor, come to us. You can go to Joanne, the assistant director. You can come to any of us in choice. We have an 877 number that you can use and someone's always answering to say, I put this quote request in, I do not have a response, but I need it because I, I really wanted that company or for whatever reason. We'll contact them and make sure that maybe it's a technical error, maybe they changed the person who receives the quotes and forgot to update that email in our system. We'll take care of it, but we'll get that done for you. The other part is right over here where you can attach a file. Now, if you were tasked with finding maybe for the superintendent of a school district or maybe the CFO of your organization, a matching armoire to go with his desk and you're like, okay, he calls it red, I'm calling it maple, he calls it early American and you're calling it colonial. It's just kind of hard. There's too many descriptions that could fall through the crack. Get a picture, say, this is what I've got now. What do you have that matches this style and this color, right? Is it a, a picture speaks a thousand words. So we tried to make this as usable to both the vendor and you, so y'all have a good start on getting your projects taken care of. Are there any questions about utilizing the get a quote? I think you'll find that it's once you get started and, and, and seeing more of what our co-op can do for you, you'll enjoy the benefit of this because like I said, it cuts to the chase and you don't have to go out looking for the vendors to supply your need. Okay, just a note on some of the other uh, benefits that are loaded on our website. We have under about choice partners, it's a button. There's a drop down with many things here. One of the things is events and that's where we go out and exhibit or are at conferences. And as Steve said, please stop by the booth. We'd love to have you do that. We have vendor spotlights and we also have current news. Now under current news, I wanted to share with everybody here. We put out monthly in the marketing department, a newsletter for choice called Leaders Choice. If you don't see that in your emails, please contact someone here at Choice and say, I would like to be added to that list. We have only so many contacts that were notified from your organization. But if you wanna be included, it's easy enough for us to add. We'd love you to be a user. If you register for a user login, like I showed you earlier on, that will definitely afford you getting the leader's choice. I would say to check your spam folder if you're registered and you haven't got it because it does come with graphics and pictures and sometimes we have firewalls that are really good and it blocks it but either way contact us and we'll help you get there oh well hello <laughs> we have we do have in the same spot many faqs you can see here and if you didn't get your question answered here please check the faqs it could be very easily found there and or again, pick up our 877 number and call us and we'll be happy to assist. So this is one of the other things I wanted to show you. This is another landing page for another vendor, but what we couldn't get the whole picture in together, this is the contact info that we list for the vendor themselves. Choice wants you to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with our vendors. We don't have to be in the middle. So you can contact them directly to get started and we put their information there. And what we usually find is that the first name that's listed is where your quote request goes to. So that's, that's why we're saying we're gonna contact them if they don't respond to you to ensure that that email works best. So this is where I was telling you, there's a lot of us that are here today. We wanna meet all of you, but it's hard to remember names. And if you want emails, this is what our contact look list, list looks like. It has everybody's name that turns into an email. It also has our phone number. And um, I was gonna say at the very, very top, you can see our 877 number there, 877-696-2122. And it's answered almost 24 seven, but the rest of us are available at any time through email and through 
our, our either cell phone or our landline. So we're happy to help. And like I said, pick up my business card at the back if there's anything that you'd like to have more information on. Now, at this point in time, if there's anybody who is gonna need to leave or is not going to stay for our jock order contracting information, there is going to be dropped in the chat box, a link to take a survey, or if you're here in person and you have to leave, their table tents with a QR code. We'd really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Our job order contracting information. All right, Joanne, did you get the survey link posted? Not yet. Okay. Wonderful. Good morning. How is everyone? Y'all are a little bit awake. I'll, I'll do my best to make a very dry subject entertaining for you. We'll try to waken you up a little bit. Uh, online people, hopefully you can hear me okay. If not, please drop into the chat if you have any questions during the presentation and I will read them out loud. Um, and address them. Uh, let me know if there's any audio or video problems as well. As Janet stated, my name is Stephen Kendrick. I'm Senior Manager of Facilities Planning at Harris County Department of Education. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, all through high school and college, I worked as an electrician's apprentice. I worked for a general contractor, um, and we, we worked for a variety of clients. After I graduated college, um, I did a short stint in the oil field, and then I ended up building homes when the bottom thought of the market in 08. I jumped over and went to work for Santa Fe ISD in the maintenance and operations department. So I got to sit on that facility guy's seat and see his needs and, and, and perspective. And then Choice Partners recruited me after about six years at the school district uh, to be over their construction compliance. I did that for three years before I landed in the seat that I'm in now. So I've had the privilege of being the contractor, the facility guy, and the procurement guy. And I've seen all three sides of that table and the disconnects in communication and the varying needs and focuses of each uh, seat. Couple of things. I'm going to start off with before I go into this. Um, so typically, uh, I get called out for problems, right? There's an issue. And I always start with who is determining if the project is maintenance or construction, who is ensuring that the cooperative contract you're using covers what it is you're procuring. In my history, I have seen a contractor pouring concrete parking lots with a pressure washing contract. I have seen an electrical contract doing full blown construction, a complete renovation of a high school. I have seen people use maintenance contracts for construction, but we all know that a construction contract is very different than a maintenance contract, right? We have prevailing wages that come into play, uh, possibly liquidated damages. What's our notice to proceed? Do we have to have an engineer or an architect? Um, all these different aspects, the contracting vehicles are very different with very different legal requirements, right? And so I go out there and I first start off with saying, who's responsible for this? And purchasing says, well, the facility guys are. They should know whether they're doing maintenance or construction, right? And I go to the maintenance guys and I say, who's responsible for determining if this is maintenance or construction and that you're using the right contract? They say, listen, man, all I want is a PO. They tell me to get them three quotes. I get them three quotes. They want one quote. I get them one quote. I just want the PO. I got to do this project. 
And at the end of the day, I find out that nobody's making the decision and nobody's verifying the contract. Many people don't even know what the cooperative contract stayed in them or ensure that they're actually getting cooperative pricing. How often do we even have that discussion with our vendor and let them know prior to asking them to quote the project, which contract we want them to use? Because if we don't tell them that, what are the odds they're gonna read our mind and give us that pricing? Slim to none. When I sat in the facility seat, what happened was, is I asked for a quote and then I went to purchasing and they said, are they on a cooperative? And I go back and say, are you on a cooperative? And they say, yes, add 2% to my price. Did they bid their off the street price plus 2%? Or did they bid something completely different possibly to that cooperative? Most likely they bid something very different, okay? Many of these sales guys out here, there's a lot of attrition. The guy that filled out and responded to the contract is no longer with the company. There's a new guy, he doesn't know what the pricing states. He's just using their standard pricing in whatever program they're using, right? So I'm gonna to discuss today why job order contracting. Why is that important, right? A lot of people think Jock is a four letter word. Ooh, I don't like Jock, I don't want Jock. I'd rather use the time of material contract. That's where I'm safe. I understand that it makes sense, it's easy. Maintenance versus construction. How do you determine that? And why is that determination so important? Concepts including trade jock versus regular jock, and then quoting versus bidding. And so you understand, and, and please for our audience online, if you're outside the state of Texas, it may be very different for you. Uh, and I understand in certain states like Arizona and California, some of this will be very different. And I'll try to address those differences. But in Texas, if you are performing a construction service, it does not matter if you are a trade or a general contractor, it still has to be procured under a construction contract. The only IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract for construction services is job order contracting. So what that means is that the time you do the contract, if there is no project specific scope of work, and you are doing an on-call contract to call trades or contractors out in the future, next tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. The only option they give you legally in Texas Government Code 2269 is job order contracting. It is not specific to general contractors. It applies to anyone performing a construction service. And then how to legally use a choice partners job contract this is a choice partners training. So, so we're talking about choice contracts. 98% of everything I tell you today applies to all job order contracting, whether it's internal with your university, whether it's through another cooperative, the law is the same, it does not change. So why does legal compliance even matter, right? And for some people it, it, it may not until a problem arises. But the deal is that different procurement rules apply. Contracts not properly procured can be voided or unenforceable. Officials and officers who violate procurement statutes can be subject to criminal penalties. Public works contracts may trigger bonding and prevailing wage requirements. Legal mistakes can delay your project, jeopardize your budget and result in cost overruns and subject the governmental entity to financial liability to vendors, contractors, and subcontractors, sub-subcontractors. I'll give you some examples of this here in a minute. I already kind of hit on this, but why time and materials? And if you're providing construction services, it is the only method allowed to select contractors for future undefined projects. This says Texas Education Code 44031. That's where K through 12 starts in colleges. If you're a university, it's Texas Education Code 51, okay? 
If you're a city or a county, then your code points you to Texas Government Code 2269 for construction services. So does Texas Education Code. So what is job order contracting? Okay, I'm gonna start off by saying um, universities have their construction statutes in a separate section, as I said, Texas Education Code 51. Um, your definition is slightly different. It's, it's almost the same, but it doesn't include the word maintenance in it. But it's basically a procurement method used for maintenance, repair, alteration, renovation, remediation, or minor construction of a facilities when the work is of a reoccurring nature, but the delivery times, types, and quantities of work required are indefinite. That's the IDIQ part I was talking about, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. You're doing a contract today, all those projects and emergencies that show up tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. If you notice, it also says minor construction. You should not be running an entire bond program through job order contracting or a cooperative. Okay, you really shouldn't be building a brand new facility. Okay, what's minor for your organization is going to kind of depend on the size of your organization and your budget. Um, there is no real legal guidance to that. There's only one case law that I'm aware of. Um, and with that school district, it said they did not consider a project of $9 million to be minor construction. So $9 million for that size school was kind of the cap for that judge. So factors to consider. I'm gonna tell you, this does not follow normal everyday logic, okay? If you work in facilities or, or, or you've worked for a contractor in your past, what you're gonna to hear today is gonna to sound very funny, okay? The first thing is, and if you notice, every slide I've given the reference where I found this. So you can go back and verify everything I'm telling you today. Uh, if you can't read that, this presentation will be made available on Choice Partners website. You click on the About Us tab and then Presentations. You go find this presentation and download it. But basically, like for like, that is the only thing I ever hear anybody uh, consider when they're determining construction typically. Well, I've got a 300 ton uh, train chiller. I'm replacing it with the new 300 ton train chiller. It's like for like, that's maintenance. Do you all agree? It's over $8,000 and it's mechanical and electrical. Say Texas says you have to have an engineer. It's over $25,000, requires a payment bond. It's over $100,000, it requires a performance bond. It has to comply with new energy code. You have to permit it. Does this still sound like maintenance? Not to mention that they have said that if it was like for like, it would be 100% based on old technology. So all those new controls that are added to these chillers, that's an upgrade. It's not like for like, it's new and upgraded. And they actually defined like for like as not new or upgraded. Maintenance is to maintain what's existing, maintain that existing chiller to extend its life. Construction is when it's reached into life and you have to replace it. Is this blowing y'all's mind? It blew my mind, I'm not gonna lie. Scale and complexity of the project, right? Uh, and the physical size of the, of the project. And I like to use roofing here as my example. I pick on roofers. Half a roof of a 10 by 10 shed with uh, shingles can probably be considered maintenance. If I take that exact same example, but I apply it to a 620,000 square foot high school, my physical size dramatically increased. I may be going back with the exact same roofing system, but it's still new. It's over $20,000, so it's supposed to be re-engineered. And I also have penetrations, curbs. I have to make sure that that roof drains properly and doesn't hold water. 
Did my scaling complexity dramatically increase? Yes. Did my physical size dramatically increase? Yes. And that's considered construction. The only time this ever seems to be an issue is if a vendor doesn't get an award, if uh, employees don't get paid prevailing wages and they were supposed to and they find out, um, if a subcontractor or sub subcontractor doesn't get paid. That's when these things go to court and then all, all of these issues surface. Here's the example. Uh, this happened to a school district several years ago. It almost happened again to two more school districts during COVID. Y'all have heard of the BYOD, bring your own device, one-to-one -one initiative, an electronic device for every student attending school, right? And they had to upgrade their infrastructure to support the additional bandwidth. They had to run additional cabling, uh, hot spots. They had to light up black fiber. The subcontractor that did the cabling project did not get paid, but the contractor was paid in full. Subcontractor went back to the district and said, I want your payment bond. They said, we, we didn't get a payment bond. We, we're not legally required to. This is a technology project. We only have to get it if it's a construction project. The case went to court and the judge went back to this. He said, it wasn't like for like. You were adding new cabling and you were upgrading your system. Scale and complexity was very large. You did it district wide. Right, and the physical size was very large. Again, you have very large buildings district wide. He deemed it was construction, even though it ran out of the technology department and that school district had to pay for that project twice. They had already paid the general contractor and then they had to go back and pay the subcontractor as well. That's why this decision is important because the additional things go into the procurement when it gets classified as construction. Jocks procured by cooperatives. Um, again, this pretty much applies to all job order contracting, but you can basically select the vendor without having to do your own competitive procurement process. The cooperative did that legal, formal solicitation. We did the advertising. We did the evaluation. We took it to our board for approval. Okay, you don't have to do that. Now, it only satisfies the procurement requirement, not the contracting requirement. And here's what I mean by that. Does the co-op know what your adopted prevailing wage rate schedule is? Do they know what constitutes a notice to proceed? Do they know what your insurance requirements are? Do they know anything about your specific scope of work? Do they know if you're gonna require prevailing wages? Do they know, I mean, I said that wrong, liquidated damages? No, they don't know that. What they know is they wrote a contract for any and all governmental entities and nonprofits to be able to utilize. But you should always have a supplemental contract that is specific to your entity that is specific to your scope of work and your requirements under their contract by in between you and the vendor you're working with, okay? Um, statute for job order contracting requires a single document with both party signatures, okay? That went to court. School district argued that they had the vendor's proposal with the vendor's signature. They issued a PO with their signature. The two documents became one document. And the judge said, no, what you have is a single guarantee to pay PO. You're guaranteed to pay with your signature. And I have a vendor's proposal with their signature. And both of you have two different terms and conditions, but I don't have a singular document with everyone agreeing to the same thing. You don't have a contract as defined in statute. This only applies to job order contracting. So please don't misunderstand this to think it applies to everything, right? Many times the PO is the contract. 
In job order contracting, you're not. It's a guarantee to pay. Make sense? It's the only method allowed to select contractors for future undefined projects. It is the only construction delivery method allowed in the state of Texas. So there are cooperatives outside of the state of Texas and they do have other construction delivery methods and it is legal in their state. However, those contracts are not legal here in Texas. So what's a jock estimate? And my universities actually have this down pretty good. My K through 12, not as much. Typically when I go out and I talk, they say, well, it's, a, it's, it's their proposal with the lump sum. Okay. To understand what job order contracting is, it's a unit price book, contract name unit price book. And the only thing these vendors bid is a coefficient. It's basically a multiplier that increases or decreases the price that already exists in that price book, okay? So to understand, a 0.90 coefficient is 10% off the price book. A 1.10 coefficient is a 10% increase on the pricing in the price book, okay? Is there any way that I can verify that they followed the contract's legally bid pricing if they give me a lump sum. There is zero way. I cannot verify it, okay? You should always obtain the line item estimate from the unit price book named in the contract. For choice partners, they name four. Uh, RS means, which is kind of the industry standard, uh, Craftsman National Construction Cost Estimator, Xactimate, a lot of times if you're working with insurance, they wanna see Xactimate. And then we also have Sierra West for our K through 12 out in California. We know that's a required price book out there. Should have the contract number on it. Remember, they don't know what pricing to give you if you don't tell them which pricing to use. Line item assessment is based on the unit price book. It's not time and material. It's not their off the street price plus 2% based on the unit price book. It should be a localized uh, by the city cost index. And basically to understand these unit price books are based on national average, okay? Then you go in and you put in the zip code and it increases or decreases that national average pricing based on your area, okay? Unit price book runs roughly 35 to 40% markup on national average. And in the Houston area, uh, I want to say the last time I looked, it was, uh, it gave you about 12% off. So what is that? 23 to 28. Okay. And then their coefficient discounts that even further. All subcontractor pricing must be estimated using the unit price book for all scopes of work. So if you're working again, let's say a roofer, and he line items out all of his roofing line items. But then he's got a, a few electrical items. He says electrical subcontractor 50,000, plumbing subcontractor 75,000. Is that allowed? And the answer is no. Okay. The unit price books have plumbing line items, they have electrical line items, and they should be following that pricing, not their subcontractor's bid plus, you know, 10 and 10. Or, or eight, 10, and 10, whatever it is they're doing. This is a little bit small. I'll try to make it larger. It's still probably gonna be hard for you to see, um, but as I said before, you can download our presentation and see this. Um, we have this in PDF, we can email out upon request. But this is what a line item estimate could or should look like, okay? You notice right at the top, we've got the choice partner's contract number, okay? Then it gives us the data release. Are they using the most current RS means data or are they using the price book they bought five years ago? They should be using the most current. We check that. The quantity, how many of each line item are they using, okay? The 12 digit code, 
I can type that 12 digit code into RS means and verify that nothing else on this estimate has been manipulated. I typically either check my big ticket items um, or roughly 10% of the estimate, depending on how large the project is. It gives me a description and anything that's not in this description is a new line item. So for an example, let's say that, that they had a backhoe rental and it did not say it included an operator, then they could have an additional line item for that operator. Make sense? <clears throat> it gives you the unit of measure and then your total columns. If you're using RS means on a choice partner's contract, we require them to use the total OMP and extended total OMP column. And that's overhead and profit. What that means is the overhead and profit is already added to the pricing. They cannot add additional overhead and profit. So when you're using RS means through choice partners, you should never see an additional line for overhead or profit. It's included in their coefficient and the OMP pricing. Okay, the other price books don't provide OMP pricing, uh, but still the overhead and profit should be shown through their coefficient, not as additional line items. Labor type, R&R, repair and renovation, could say STD, standard union. What it should not say, well, in most cases, is user. If it says user, then I know that that they created it or they changed something in it. There is a clause in our contracts for non-pre-priced line items. They should be very few and far between, however, okay? Either one, it has to be determined to be a sole source. And that's not simply getting a sole source affidavit from a vendor. Um, like in our K through 12 market, a lot of times they have to submit it to TEA for approval. The other option is that if there is truly no line item in the price book that is remotely close to what they're doing, then they have to obtain three quotes and then add the markup percentage they bid to us, okay? As I said, those should be very few and far between. You should not see that user there hardly ever. Data release, is it the most current? City cost index, if you can see here, it says Texas, Houston, 770 to 772. Please understand that the city is not that important. And what I mean by that is, if you go into this uh, price book and you type in 775, it's gonna say Galveston 775. But I know that Laporte 775, I know that Baytown is 775, so I'm not so much worried about the city as I am that those three digits match. After that is a note section. Um, they're using a line item that's similar, but not exact. They can tell you what it is they are giving you. They can give you the calculations or their waste factors. If you're working with federal funds, a lot of times they wanna see where that item's going. So like if you're working for FEMA, it might say 70% went to Hall A, 20% went to Hall B, 30 or 10% went to Hall C, or 70% went to the high school, 20% went to field house, 10% went to the chiller yard. They like to see that breakdown. You get your subtotal, and then they should apply their coefficient. That's the only thing they legally bid. And discount the pricing further, add any uh, permitting or bonding as a pass-through cost, and that's how they arrive at that lump sum total they like to give you. You should always receive this with that lump sum. Review the jock quote. I review all my own quotes. Choice partners will review the quote for you if you request it. Um, basically, we're not gonna review it against scope and spec, okay? Uh, that's y'all's job but we will make sure that it complies with the contract. So we're gonna check the city cost index, the coefficient, uh, that they use the correct pricing column, that the data release is current from the time you requested the quote. 
Their use of non-pre-priced line items, did they use them and did they use them correctly? Attempts pass through the cooperative fee. You should never see a cooperative fee on a jock quote. Choice Partners doesn't allow it and no other cooperative I know of allows it. It's in their coefficient in every contract I've ever read. If they add it as an additional line item, you're basically paying for it twice. The use of division one, we restrict the use of division one. Division one is the section of the price book for your overhead items. Some things we allow like equipment rental, but other things we don't allow like cell phones, trucks, office overhead, office staff, uh, final cleanup by GC, project supervision, site superintendent. Those things are all included in the coefficient. You should not have those as additional line items unless you have extenuating circumstances on that project and you require something that goes above and beyond what would be customary for that project. And then adjustment factors. Uh, that basically just adjusts the pricing based on working conditions. So if they're working in confined spaces or elevated spaces, uh, you'll have adjustment factors, okay? We just make you aware that they're there. You have to go back and determine if they truly apply to your scope of work. There is no fee hidden or otherwise choice partners reviewing the quote, okay? They don't charge the vendor. They don't charge you the member. There's no fee. It's just a part of their agreement through the interlocal that, that they'll provide you upon request. Um, typically, choice partners will give you a response within 24 to 48 hours. If the estimate is not compliant, then the turnaround time to get it compliant will be dependent on that vendor and how quickly they can turn it around. So we'll give you an answer. Yes, it's compliant. No, it's not compliant, but we're going to get it fixed within 24 to 48 hours. And then however long it takes us to actually get it corrected. I'm not gonna hit on this too much because Jeff covered it already. Um, but what I do want you to understand is that between the CP member, and you, and the awarded contract holder, okay? Y'all should have a supplemental agreement for job order contracting. Don't count on the choice partner contract only to cover everything, okay? This was a big issue during Hurricane Harvey. Not so much with us, but with cooperative purchasing in general. You know, uh, they called contractors out. They sent them straight to work. And then they said, uh, uh, what prevailing wages did they follow? What does your contract say? It says they got to follow yours. You got to tell them. Well, we want to do progressive billing. And, and what does your contract state? It states that you'll have to negotiate that in your supplemental agreement. The co-op does not know what your entity requires. And you need that supplemental agreement, something more than that PO to cover all those things. I've kind of hammered this one home a few times already. Use the master job order contract. Um, it should have your scope of work in it, okay? It should be formal in writing, have your scope of work. The job contractor can help you develop that scope of work, but then you should issue it to them to give you a quote off of. Include your, your prevailing wage rate as an attachment, okay? You have to let them know what your prevailing wage rate is. Liquidated damages, are you gonna have them? Retainage, are you gonna hold retainage? Terms and conditions specific to you, and then make sure that both parties sign it. I've already hit on that. I'm not gonna hit that again. Public works bonds, okay? Uh, this can be found in Texas Government Code 2253. It basically says that a performance bond is required if the contract's in excess of $100,000. Okay, this protects you from financial losses arising from default, material breach, termination, or abandonment of the project. A payment bond is required if a contract is in excess of, and this one's going to depend on what type of governmental entity you are. Okay, it's 25,000 
uh, if the governmental entity is not a municipality or joint board. If you are a municipality or joint board, it's 50,000. And what this does is it protects you, the governmental entity, from claims for non-payment to suppliers, subcontractors, and sub-subcontractors. Jocks and using an architect or an engineer, okay? Job order contracting, the statute that governs it has exclusions. One of the exclusions is that you cannot procure architectural or engineering services through a job order contract. What does that mean? That means that the job order, con the contractor himself cannot get payment on the POU issued to cover any kind of architectural or engineering services, even if he hires an outside third party to do it. Make sense? If the PO references a job order contract, there cannot be funds on that PO for architectural or engineering services. Another exception, just because I'm on that, is civil works projects, okay? Civil works is excluded from job order contracting. Uh, so you shouldn't be doing what? Drainage projects, roads, things of that nature, taxiways. Exception to engineering services, it's, it's a little bit, well, wait, architectural services are required if it's $100,000 and it's a new project, or $50,000 if it's an alteration or addition. Engineering is written as an exception, so it tells you when engineering is not required. It basically says an engineer not required if a project involving electrical or mechanical will cost 8,000 or less. So when your project exceeds 8,000, it's mechanical or electrical, you're supposed to have an engineer. A project not involving electrical or mechanical engineering uh, that will cost 20,000 or less, okay? <clears throat> so what must go to the board? Almost everybody, has a default construction procurement method. For me, it's in our board policy. Um, a lot of times the, the default in Texas is lowest responsible bidder. Our local policy changes it to, I wanna say CSP, competitive sale proposals. If I wanna use design and build, if I wanna use CM at risk, CM agent or job order contracting, I have to go back to my board for approval on that construction delivery method. Okay. Job orders exceeding $500,000 also have to go back to your board for approval. Okay. That is a state cap. Your local policy may reduce that. It might be where I came from in my previous district, it was $25,000. Uh, where I'm at now, I want to say for construction, it's $100,000. Okay. So it can be reduced. You need to know what's required with your entity. So trade jock versus jock. And I kind of hit on this already, but a trade jock allows the use of one trade or division, okay? It reduces your overhead expenses because you're not having to pay for a general contractor to manage the whole project. But here's the deal, the contract, is supposed to specify which divisions they're awarded. So it may be division 26 electrical, okay? If they're doing an electrical project, can they go do windows? No, no. If they open up a wall for electrical and they discover asbestos, can they go do the remediation? No, they can only do what they're awarded, okay? <clears throat> Shut it down. Oh, take a break. All right. Gotcha. We're almost to the end. I think we got what, two slides? <laughs> cool. All right. Well, we're going to take a break. Um, what'd you say, five minutes? Yeah, five to ten. No more. Ten at the most? Okay.
Good deal. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
Okay, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, I only have about two or three more slides, right? Um, but basically in Texas, if you're doing construction, if it meets those three criteria or one of the three criteria we discussed earlier, falls under construction, and that's where trade jock comes in. If you've noticed here in the last few years, cooperatives have started having time and material maintenance contracts and single trade contracts. So that you understand Choice Partners does not do that. Okay, they don't have just a maintenance contract. Uh, what they do is a hybrid of the two. They, uh, on their single trade contracts, they allow them to give you the T&M for maintenance and then also the coefficient for construction. So if you have the HVAC guy out there and he's tightening belts, uh, cleaning coils, changing AC filters, and all of a sudden he goes out there on a unit that went down and says, hey, it's got to be replaced. You can use that same contract and go jump over to the construction side of it with the construction terms and continue that project. Does that make sense? Um, Choice Partners is the only one I know of that's doing that. <clears throat> Jock allows for the use of all divisions and that typically is a general contractor. Well, it's not advancing for me. Okay, quoting versus bidding. And from online folks, this is gonna be dependent on your state, okay? Um, the majority of the people here today are from Texas, and this applies to Texas only. The bit of the proposal, right, is that formal written sealed response that satisfies the state's procurement requirements for a government entity, okay? It's that coefficient against that unit price book. For a quote, the vendor is providing you a job specific price in writing using the price they bid, okay? Which is their coefficient against the unit price book. You're gonna have vendors say, you, you can't recompete me. You can't get multiple quotes, you're recompeting me. If you're recompeting coefficients, then they're right. But if all you're doing is asking for proposals based on pricing they already bid, state says you shall get one, but you can get as many as you want. Um, I typically recommend no more than three because when vendors find out that you're sending it out to 20 people, they stop showing up to, to bid your projects, okay? They, they don't want, they've already been competed once, they don't want to have to compete with anyone and everyone a second time. They'll walk off of that, that job site walk. One to three, uh, depending. Um, this is governed by a lot of things, such as your funding source. Is it federal, state, or local? What is your local policy state? You know, have those uh, dollar thresholds been reduced? Steve talked a little bit earlier about um, three quotes, and I think he said something about two CFR, 200. That's not actually where it's found, okay? Uh, there is the simplified acquisition threshold, which many people online discussed, and they said, well, it's three quotes. If it's under $10,000, that's true, but that's not specific to cooperative purchasing. You have to remember, cooperative purchasing, at least in the state of Texas, is an interlocal agreement. It is a competitively bid contract. It's not just a negotiated contract. Um, and in some other states, co-ops don't have to have competitively bid contracts. In Texas, the $10,000 doesn't apply because it was competitively bid. What we're finding here in Texas, though, is that the state agencies managing these federal grants are requiring more than one quote when using a cooperative. Uh, if you work with child nutrition um, and, and TDA, they're requiring three quotes. If you work with uh, FEMA, they want to see that you got three quotes if you're using a cooperative contract and that one of them was from a minority owned or woman owned business, or that you at least attempted to include them in the quoting process. Um, ESSER funds, uh, TEA is going to manage that. And I am being told that they're about to issue guidance saying two or more quotes when using a cooperative. 
So please understand these requirements, they're separate from uniform guidance and the simple, simple acquisition threshold. This is something that our state agencies overseeing these grants are putting into place and requiring, okay? If you're outside the state of Texas, I don't know that they're uh, making you do the same thing. Um, I haven't come across it in any other state but here. But here, almost every uh, state agency overseeing federal grants is starting to go to two or three quotes when using a cooperative. And the reason is this, the cooperative does not have a defined scope of work for you, okay? Uh, they, they believe that, you know, based on quantities, if you did your own bid, you might get a better price, you might get a worse price, but they want to see the three quotes to justify the price, okay? Um, some final thoughts. Make sure you establish that procurement method with your vendor prior to them quoting the job, okay? If you don't, I can almost 100% guarantee that it's not gonna comply with the cooperative contract. I include the contract number on the quote and the PO, that's your audit trail. If something were to ever happen, anything was to ever go to court, you would have that auditing trail. Verify pricing by requesting their line item estimate. If you're, run, if you're issuing POs on lump sums, there's absolutely no way to verify that they're complying with that contract. You don't know if they're using division one correctly. You don't know if they use non-pre-priced items. You don't even know if they use the unit price book or their coefficient. Um, you should send a confirming copy of your POs to the cooperatives. Most cooperatives with the exception of buy board, um, make the vendors report. The issue with that is that not all vendors report or report completely. If you want the cooperative to have a record of your procurement under their contract, you should also send them something documenting it. Not all coefficients are created equal. Please understand that every cooperative contract defines coefficient differently, okay? Uh, cooperative A will say, here's the unit price book, give me your coefficient. Um, cooperative B will say, here's the price book, but you're not allowed to use division one. Cooperative C will say, well, I want you to use O&P pricing instead of bear pricing. It's all different. So, and this is a real world example. I did have a chiller replacement, uh, roughly, I don't know, $600,000 project. Three quotes from three vendors on three different cooperatives. And the guy with the highest coefficient came in $100,000 lower than the next guy. What happened? What happened was, is he wasn't allowed to use any division one. He had to use the overhead and profit pricing. He, he could not manipulate or use things that the other guys could. And that's why they gave a lower coefficient because they knew they had more resources at their disposal to hit their number on the estimate, okay? So shopping coefficients is an absolutely terrible way to compare pricing. You need those quotes. Um, not all co-ops are created equal. Um, they don't all follow state law. Uh, not all of them are 2CFR 200 or Edgar or uniform guidance. That's all the same set of statutes, but everyone calls it something different. Compliant. And remember to get that governing uh, body approval. Um, the deal with the state of Texas, and many of you probably experienced this. Back in 2017, we had that little thing called Hurricane Harvey. And FEMA issued a white paper. And they said, first, they wanted to say that cooperative purchasing was illegal because they did not understand that it was interlocal agreement and cooperatives in Texas legally procured these contracts. They weren't just negotiated. When we got past that, they said, well, you must, they, the co-op must be in the state of Texas. We all know uniform guidance to CFR 200, Edgar, says you can't discriminate based on location, right? So they had to go back and amend that white paper and then issue a new fact sheet that said, yes, you can use cooperatives outside of the state of Texas. However, they must still follow state law. Okay, 
So when using federal funds, you have to follow the most restrictive of federal, state, or local policy. Is there any questions? Have I bored y'all to tears, overwhelmed you? You're embarrassed to ask your question in front of everybody. You're going to come hit me up later. <laughs> Is there anything online, Jojo? Okay, wonderful. Well, if you do have questions, please submit them. Um, I want to say on the About Us, you can find all of our contact information. Shoot us an email, give us a phone call. We'd be happy to answer or discuss your questions. Thank you all. Jeff, do you want to close it out? <laughs> Don't forget to fill out the survey if you have not done so already. Thank you. No, I think we're done on things. There we go. There's some. Ooh. Okay, I'm just going to hold the microphone for a few minutes. Usually I'm like the last person before everybody in here gets to eat. So they're eating and as long as they haven't eaten and fallen asleep yet, we're good. But uh, anyway, just kind of a few little wrap things. I had, I had notes and I had like seven or eight or nine points. And I think Stephen covered about half of them on that, on that last slide. So, uh, so he, did, he did a good job. I was like, ah, dang, I can knock that one off, knock that one off. But really, just some things I want that we want you to remember. You know, when you're when you're looking to uh, use a co-op as your method of procurement, just do your due diligence. Make sure you can either find the due diligence that Steve talked about, or or ask questions. Or if it's a uh, jock contract, um, there there are probably co-ops out there that will review and verify uh, line item estimates or quotes or pricing. Uh, I don't know how anyone else does it. I know how we do it. I know we keep people straight. We we can be at odds with 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 the, with contractors that don't want to do things uh, the right way, but we'd much rather do things the right way and and uh, and let you know uh, what needs to be done. And it's a very thorough examination. I know Stephen talked about a lot of different points up there. One of the things he kept he emphasized with this six hundred thousand dollar project that was one of my bullet points on here is that. All cooperatives are not created equal, and all co all uh, uh, coefficients are not equal. And again, I, I'll just reemphasize exactly what he said. Don't don't assume that a 0.67 coefficient is going to give you a price and a 0.75. I know those are low numbers. I'm just pulling those out of thin air. Uh, get 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 a get a quote. You're not rebidding. You're not rebidding a competitive price. All you're doing is getting a quote based on their competitive response. And uh, a lot of a lot of people there, there's a there's a thought process there that says you can't even do that. But as Stephen said, at least in the state of Texas, you can, and it may be different in a lot of other states for some of our online friends. And 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 they are different laws. So just be just be uh, just be very cognizant out on that. I know there's I won't name the name the contractor, but I've had one contractor tell me, and I hate to even repeat it, but he's like, oh. We can. We don't use your contracts because we can division one the hell out of our customers. And what he means by that is just like Stephen said, he can use that local coefficient and be a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars higher on a small project because uh, there aren't the restrictions on the division one that they bid on their co-op that Stephen talked about your overhead and your and your office and 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 things like that. So just 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 do your due diligence. We're not. We like to say we're not the biggest, but we're the best. But you know, everybody's got their strengths and weaknesses. Just just make sure that you are uh, good stewards of your tax dollars or or uh, or your your funding sources and and things of that nature. Also, um, I think I had a lot of things to say, but Stephen just he just he just stole the thunder there. That last that last slide, you know, on the on the uh, on the audit and in, in general. One of the things is that we uh, we are a government entity, literally. That's our we're in teacher retirement system, like K through 12, and, and colleges around. Uh, we use our own contracts. We've passed audit. We've actually last year paid quite a bit of money to just have a third party come in and, and audit us, Choice Partners, not just HCDE, but Choice Partners on uh, on controls and and uh, how compliant and things that that how we operate. Uh, I don't know that any co-op has ever done that where they just out of the clear blue said, not out of the clear blue, but 
methodically said, yeah, go ahead and take a take a look at us, you know, give us a, a microscopic microscopic review and uh, see what you think of us and tell us if we're doing good or bad. And there were no findings. So uh, it was a, it was a pretty good report. And, and we've got that if any of you folks want to look at it or look at their look at their findings paper. We've uh, we've actually sent that out a little bit also. But uh, we would like to say that we're we're very, very compliant. We're going to keep you guys safe and uh we've got good vendors we keep growing so there, there's a reason for that and uh i think and and to re uh reiterate again on esser like Stephen was talking about we've already heard you know a lot of these esser people these hvac guys have these projects lined up from one end to the other oh it's like for like yeah we're gonna do like for like guys everybody's gonna be in trouble when somebody <laughs> Somebody comes back and audits these and, and you get, get some of this money pulled. Just make sure that you're doing everything right the first time. I think that's it. I hope you guys here in the room and online, I hope you learned a little something from us, learned a little bit about hopefully how we can uh, help you uh, get the procurement process going through. And like I said, don't let this be, if you're new to us, a question, I'm sorry. Yes, question. Comment? Supplemental agreement. Right. It had a horn coming out of you. I I love that comment. I. I love that comment. I'm going to step back over here and kind of repeat it. The comment from the room was uh, a young lady was an attorney and she said, I really appreciate how you guys talk about your supplemental agreements. And uh, being the person that looks at every one of the people that do exceptions to our terms and conditions, I've got a cut and paste on a Word document where I cut and paste, you know, this, this item cannot be changed, blah, blah, blah. They want to instead of just trying to amend the, the warranty section of our contract, they wanna put three pages of their warranty and especially in technology, it's really, really bad. They call it a EULA, end user license agreement. They wanna basically insert their end user license agreement into our contract. And we say, no, that's what the supplemental agreement is for. And it also says in our, uh, in our terms and conditions that the supplemental agreement can and will take precedent priority when there's a, uh, a, di a disagreement between terms and conditions. So we're not trying to hurt, we're trying to help and make, that, make it much more amenable. Our contracts are written as a general contract. They're not written, as Stephen said a number of times, I think uh, Steve probably talked about it also. They're not written to know exactly what your, your uh, insurance requirements are, what your notice to proceed is, what uh, you know, you have, are you gonna offer liquidated damages? Those are all, to be handled in something like this supplemental agreement and or the master job order that Stephen was talking about that's prevalent in the jock world. So yes, we have provisions for that and we highly encourage that. And again, I, I can't tell you how many phone calls and how many emails and back and forth, Adobe and, and, and Word comments, you know, that I, that I, it's like a broken record as far as these supplemental agreements, just saying, no, we, we don't discourage this but we're not gonna change our contract. We're gonna say, put it all in a supplemental agreement, excuse me, refer to our choice partners contract and go from there. We, we highly encourage that. And I love it that someone on the, legal, on the legal side of the world made that comment because it's a headache and a lot of people just don't understand. They wanna change our contract. We say, don't wanna do that. So very good comment, thank you. Anyway, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Thank you for coming. And uh, I know even if you're out of state and you want to come see beautiful Houston, maybe come down in August, it's 98, 99 degrees or something, and we'll feed you. But if you're local and you just wanted to stay and hide behind your computer, come on down. We had breakfast. We had fettuccine Alfredo with grilled chicken and salad and cobbler. So uh, I thank you guys for coming locally. And uh, we thank you guys for, uh, for tuning in uh, in the virtual world. 
please let this be the beginning of our conversation and let us help you uh, as we go forward and as you continue operating your businesses. Thank you. So do I. Merry Christmas. Yes.